So it's going to turn out this semester that when it comes to solvable groups, the biggest question about whether a group is or is not solvable is going to be answered about a group called the alternating group. And so what we should probably do right now, as long as we have our heads into group theory, is take a few moments to look at what is the alternating group and what are some of the properties that make the alternating group do what it does. Uh, so we're going to start that first today by talking about the alternating group in maybe a different framework than you've seen it talked about before by first talking about what is a representation of a group. Now representations are something that usually aren't covered in a first semester abstract algebra class. They're often not even covered in a second semester class either. So we're not going to do them in a whole lot of detail. But I like the idea of representations for a couple of reasons. First, that it is something new. It's a fresh take on something you may have seen before. And second, it brings a little bit of linear algebra into our puzzle. So we get a chance to think about matrices and linear transformations for a little bit, which is nice because it's visual, and everyone likes visuals. At least I do. Um, so after we talk about what representations are in kind of a general context, we'll see how to think of the alternating group in the context of representations of objects in the symmetric group. So really, the alternating groups are just subgroups, actually normal subgroups, as you will show, of symmetric groups, where the permutations in those subgroups have a certain property called a sign property that we're going to talk about in this video. So let's get started. So we're starting in a very general place. What is a representation of a group? Well, here's a definition, and it looks a little arcane when you first look at it. The definition is that a representation of a group is, if we choose a vector space, V, a V representation of a group, is a homomorphism from the group into the group of automorphisms of that vector space. Now, that's kind of a mouthful, but really, what is this group of automorphisms? It's just the group of linear transformations from that vector space to itself. But that can't really form a group unless those linear transformations also have inverses. So these are the group of invertible linear transformations from a vector space to itself. This is sometimes also known as the general linear group of that vector space. So it might be written as GL of V when you see it in a different context. So this is a group under the operation of the composition of linear transformations. But of course, if you've taken a linear algebra class, and you all have, you know that the fundamental theorem of linear algebra guarantees that every linear transformation can be represented, not in a unique way, but it can be represented by a matrix. And since these are linear transformations from, from V to the itself, those matrices are going to be square matrices. So what we're going to do is we're going to think of the automorphisms of V, the elements of that group, as being invertible n by n matrices. And to have a homomorphism from G into that group means two things. It first of all means that we're going to associate to every element of the group G some n by n matrix which we'll call phi of g, just for the moment, to emphasize that phi is the homomorphism that's doing this work. So every group element gets associated to a matrix. That's what makes this a function from g into automorphisms of v. What makes it a homomorphism is the second fact that the matrices have to multiply in this exactly the same way as the elements of the group multiply. Because this is a homomorphism, we have to have that g times h if g and h are group elements, and phi of g times phi of h if those are the matrices associated to g and h, that those products have to be the same. So what we get when we take a representation of a group g is we get a collection of square matrices that multiply together. If we make their little multiplication table, their multiplication table is identical or isomorphic to the multiplication table for the group g. This is best seen by looking at a couple of examples. Let's start by taking a two-dimensional representation of the group Z mod 4. So this is the additive group 0, 1, 2, and 3. We're going to think of 1 as being a generator of that group. And then what we're going to do is associate to the generator 1 this square matrix, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. What is that square matrix, which we'll call capital R? What does that look like in linear transformation land? Well, to figure it out, let's just first take a standard basis vector 1, 0 and ask what does this matrix do if we apply it to 1, 0? Well, the image of 1, 0 under left multiplication by this matrix is 0, 1. So that vector has been rotated by 90 degrees counterclockwise. Likewise, if we take the other standard basis vector, 0, 1, and operate on it on the left by this matrix, we end up with negative 1, 0 for its image. So it, too, has been rotated by 90 degrees. So since that's all of our basis vectors, we conclude that the entire matrix R rotates the entirety of R2 by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So that's what's happening with our, that's the matrix to which we're going to associate the generator 1 of the group Z mod 4. So since this is a homomorphism, this allows us to determine the associated matrices for the other elements of Z mod 4 as well. For instance, because in Z mod 4, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, that means that we can associate to the group element 2 
the matrix which we get by multiplying the matrix for one by the matrix for one and getting this matrix, negative one, zero, zero, negative one, what does that matrix do? It rotates by 180 degrees counterclockwise. Likewise, because two plus one is equal to three, the matrix that gets associated to three is the matrix for two times the matrix for one. Again, because phi is a homomorphism. What does that matrix do? It rotates the plane by 270 degrees. Finally, because three plus one is equal to zero in Z mod four, the matrix for three times the matrix for one had better represent the element zero. But take a look at what that is. That product of matrices is just the identity matrix. We can think of that as a rotation by 360 degrees to make this less of a surprise, right? We would expect that after we rotate by 90 degrees four times, we get something which is a rotation by 360 degrees that is really no rotation at all. Which also makes sense in Z mod four because when we add one to itself four times, we end up back at zero, modulo four. So just to reinforce the point, on one hand, we have the group Z mod 4, 0, 1, 2, and 3. On the other hand, we have this collection of four matrices that are the rotations by 90, 180, 270, and 360, which is the same as 0. And this representation is really just a connection between those two worlds, that adding 1 in the group Z mod 4 is really the same thing as rotating by 90 degrees in this collection of matrices, this 2 by 2 matrices. Also notice that each different element of Z mod 4 got a different matrix associated to it. So actually, this collection of four matrices behaves in exactly the same way that the elements of Z mod 4 do under matrix multiplication. So this is actually better than a homomorphism. It's actually a monomorphism. It's one to one. Actually, in representation land, we give that a separate name. We call a representation a faithful representation if it is a one-to-one -one homomorphism. In other words, if every different group element gets a different matrix associated to it. And this collection of four matrices, and because it's the image of a homomorphism, it's a subgroup of the general linear group of R2. In other words, the group of all two by two invertible matrices. Of course, now that we've done an abelian example, we also have to do a non-abelian example. Let's take a look at a representation of D4, the dihedral group of the square. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of the generators of D4, T and R, and we're going to associate a matrix to each one. So let's call the matrix capital T, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, and capital R, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. That's actually the same R as we saw on the previous slide for Z mod 4. Not surprising because Z mod 4 is a normal subgroup of D4. So let's take a look at what these group elements, E, R, R squared, and so forth, to what matrix would they be associated? Well, first let's look at the rotations. Naturally, the identity element gets associated with the identity matrix, again, because this is a homomorphism. And we know where R goes, but then R squared and R cubed have to go to the products of R by itself. So R squared ends up being associated with this rotation by 180 degrees, R cubed with this rotation by 270, just like on the previous slide. But now we have all these other group elements the reflections. And notice that what I've associated the little t to is a matrix which actually reflects across the horizontal axis. After all, that was how we defined d4 in the first place, right? The element t is a reflection of the square about its horizontal axis. And then the other elements, tr, tr squared, and tr cubed, get associated with other reflections across the different axes. Again, we have the property that every different element of d4 represents a different matrix. Every different symmetry in D4 represents a different matrix here. And so this is also a faithful representation, this time of D4. Notice that D4, because it's not an abelian group, and we have a faithful representation here into this group of matrices, it means that this group of matrices also is not abelian. We know that because matrix multiplication is, in general, not a commutative operation. To take our final step here, before we're done talking about representations for a minute, let's think about what representations of the symmetric group on n symbols might look like. It turns out there's a more or less standard way, called the standard representation of Sn, that we can look at representing um, Sn using n by n matrices. And the idea is that if we think of the set of objects on which the symmetric group acts, 1, 2, 3, and 4, if we think of that instead of as a set, think of it as a vector. And let's see if we can use matrices to achieve permutations of the entries of that vector. What do I mean by that? Suppose I want to achieve this permutation. 1, 2, 3, 4 becomes 2, 1, 3, 4. So I've just switched the first two entries. We know this as the element 1, 2 in the symmetric group. Well, how do I do that with a matrix? Well, because the third and the fourth entries are staying the same, I don't have to do anything to them. So I'm going to write in the third and fourth row and column of the identity matrix here, because we don't want to touch this, the third and fourth coordinates of that vector. Now we just need to achieve a swap of the first two. 
To do that, I'm just going to swap the first two rows of this identity matrix. You can check using matrix multiplication that this actually works out the way that we say it does. So what do we conclude? That the element 1, 2 in the symmetric group on four symbols is represented by this matrix in the standard representation. And the idea in general to build the matrix associated to any tra uh, permutation in the symmetric group in the standard representation, all we have to do is apply the permutation to the columns of the relevant identity matrix. So as another quick example, let's suppose in S5, I want to construct the standard representation of this element, 1, 3, 4, composed with 2, 5. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take a 5 by 5 identity matrix and just apply this permutation to its columns. So the 1, 3, 4 piece I'm going to achieve by writing the first column in the third place, the third column in the fourth place, and the fourth column in the first place. And then the 2, 5 piece, I'll write the second column in the fifth place and the fifth column in the second place. And so this matrix then will represent the element 1, 3, 4, 2, 5. So what we get at the end is an n-dimensional representation of Sn. You can check that this is also a faithful representation, because a different permutation is always going to give me a different matrix in this representation.